you guys didn't get the, a chance to get a picture of this, so there's some more here. Is that the picture you took, or they took at the plant? Sherry said Chuck gave her these, and if there was extras, just to bring them in today. So we brought them.
variance. I can't remember what variance is. They all move back, yes. <laughs> Is it time? All right. Well, hello, I'm uh, Chris Foster. I'm uh, with John Zink Company, uh, and uh, I work in the Flare team. Uh, and so Tuesday, you guys started with a little bit of Flare Basics, um, and uh, I'm going to continue on today and discuss uh, some more topics about process flares. All right, so uh, on Tuesday, you, copy, you guys covered quite a few topics uh, about flare safety um, with its ignition and relief capacity. Um, also, just going over uh, gas liquid separation, flashback uh, radiation. Um, those are some safety topics uh, about flares, how, uh, how to keep your sy uh, the systems in the plant safe. Uh, however, uh, we're going to move on to some more of the, the performance issues uh, or topics with flares. And uh, th those are going to include noise, uh, emissions, how the emissions of a flare uh, uh, affect the design, and also uh, uh, control of smoke. So controlling the smoke is, uh, is uh, part of the design for the flare. So I'm just going to pose this question to you. Why do you think you would uh, want to control smoke? Who wants to see smoke? You do? <laughs> yeah, really nobody. So, so smoke control is, a, is, is one, it keeps from uh, producing extra carbon right to the atmosphere, but um, also it's just a disturbance to uh, communities around a lot of the chemical plants. So noise, so why, would, why do you think flare noise might be a concern? Do what? People don't want to hear flares. Yeah, people don't want to hear flares, right? They're loud, they're annoying, they're disturbing. Um, so uh, you've got employees that are working close in close proximity uh, many times to these flares. Uh, most of the time people already have hearing protection in, uh, but that's to, you know, because they're in areas of, of high noise level, maybe 90 dB, right? But, the, but a flare can get up 
upwards of 100 sometimes, right? So it, it gets pretty loud. Um, and so employees w uh, working near the flares, uh, businesses that may be close to the flares, communities anymore. Um, it used to be refineries and chemical plants were uh, away from communities, but now communities have, have expanded and grown close to them. So, uh, so noise is a big thing that we need to uh, think about. Um, and then the last topic we had there was offshore platforms. Uh, if you imagine being on an offshore platform, you're on a little bitty plot space with nowhere to go, right? There's just ocean all around you. Uh, so how to minimize the noise from the flare really affects your work environment while you're out there. So some of the adverse effects of noise, noise can really affect um, not only just your, your hearing, right? So uh, uh, preventing your hearing loss, uh, but have you guys ever been to a concert that's been really loud and then afterwards you just have ringing in your ears? So it, it, when you work around it all the time, it affects you um, uh, for your sleep and just your day-to-day -day activity. Um, so, so controlling noise and making sure that, that that's an important design topic, is a, it's a health and safety aspect uh, in the design of flares. Um, so it, it's really something that's important to think about. So when you think about noise, uh, you know, we think about uh, DBA, right? So if you look here, we've got uh, OSHA's limits for noise over different hour periods. Uh, you know, so 90 over 8 hour period, 92 over 6, and you, 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 can, you can be exposed to higher levels of DBA uh, or of sound pressure. Um, for sh shorter periods of time, it can be higher without causing serious damage. Uh, but the, these are kind of OSHA's guidelines here. And so um, the issue with flaring is you get what you get, right? It's the amount of gas that comes out of the end of the pipe and, and it's not like you can turn it down. If the plant has to relieve, it relieves, right? So the, the question is, are there other mitigation things that we can do with noise uh, to help with those topics? So um, let's think about this. Flame, is, is fire what causes noise? In all these combustion topics that we've talked about, would, would we say fire is what causes noise? Not I, so partially, but not in whole, right? There's a lot of things that go into it. So if we, if we look at what causes noise, especially from a flare, right? Here you have a flame just like a candle. Do you hear a candle? Kind of. If you put your ear up next to it, you can kind of hear it just barely, but it's not, it's nothing that's going to harm you, right? Uh, because it's a nice laminar flame. The turbulence, right, that comes from coming out of, uh, you know, out of a fixed area, orifice, shoving a whole lot of gas through it, right, creates a lot of, it entrains a whole bunch of air, mixes things, it all swirls around. That turbulence is what call, creates what we call combustion roar, right? It, it's, it, it is that fire, that combustion process making all that noise. So that's really where um, it, it's where all that noise comes from is uh, from that turbulence. You, know, you can see from here uh, the turbulence that comes from that gas coming out of a flare. So we look at ways to mitigate that um, directionally, right? So we can, sometimes we can direct that noise away. So like on this platform here, sometimes you can angle that so that that the flame actually shoots away. It actually reduces the noise level, right? Um, you can break it up into different pieces so there's not as much coming out from each section. Um, that'll help. So there's a lot of different uh, aspects uh, when looking at it. But uh, it, it's an important uh, health and safety issue uh, when we're looking at designing flares. So that, that's, a, that's just a little bit on noise. I think that just kind of continues on from uh, what Sherry was sharing with you guys on Tuesday. Um, but what we want to move on to is, is emissions, right? So what a lot of people are worried about today, uh, and rightfully so, are emissions, right? Polluting the atmosphere and, and uh, all the pollutants that come from that. So we're going to move on to uh, talking about flare emissions and, and what it means uh, to have a flare and, and what kind of emissions that you've got coming from the flare. 
So uh, emissions, what were you say? What would you say a couple things are of concern due to flare emissions? I would say you know there's several things, right? You don't want you you want the hydrocarbons to be fully combusted, right? So that you're not worried about hydrocarbons in the air, right? So that's that's one thing. You want as as complete combustion as as possible. Um, the other thing is, I mean, it just affects the atmosphere, right? It, it affects the uh, the ozone, right? So methane gases and whatnot um, uh, just affect the the overall health of everything. So we have to ensure that we're getting good what we uh, call either combustion efficiency or destruction efficiency. So and, and the pollutants, they they go to the atmosphere, they uh, uh, and they get moved around uh, by different winds and whatnot. So. Why are flare gas emissions a concern? All right, so if we had good combustion, your combustion products are going to be water vapor and carbon dioxide. And uh, water vapor and carbon dioxide, that's, that's a good mixture, right? The carbon dioxide is used uh, with trees and, and plants and whatnot. Uh, water vapor is not harmful to anybody. So, um, so that's what we want. What we don't want is products of incomplete combustion. Right? And so these products of incomplete combustion um, is carbon monoxide, unburned hydrocarbons, uh, particulate matter, right? So that's that smoke we were talking about that we don't want. Um, and then uh, sometimes in, in gases, there's other uh, reactions that, that lead to NOx and SOx, SO2. So uh, with um, incomplete combustion, Right, there's, there's generally two different uh, groups of classifications, right? So you, there's one called VOCs, uh, and VOCs are uh, really uh, smog, the things that you see um, on the news a lot talking about pollution, right? Um, ozone alert days. Um, and then uh, methane, which uh, is considered a greenhouse gas, um, so with, uh, that goes along with uh, global warming and whatnot. So th these are some of those uh, products of incomplete combustion that we don't want to see uh, when designing flares. So uh, how efficient is a flare? Uh, in, in your guys' ideas, what should, what, sh what should the efficiencies of a flare be? Pretty high? As close to 100 as you can get. As close to 100 as you can get, all right. Uh, do any of you happen to know what the EPA regulates things to? No? All right. Well, so uh, the EPA uh, looks at combustion efficiency and destruction efficiency. They have a relationship, uh, but they're not the same thing. Um, so when we look at destruction efficiencies, all right, so destruction efficiencies is basically the percentage of, you know, or the difference of the mass pollutant leaving the flare, so how much is not burned over the total uh, mass of the pollutant going to the flare. Um, so if, if there's only 2%, right, then we're 98% combustion efficiency or destruction efficiency. So what you want, again, is the major products of combustion, which is the water vapor and carbon dioxide. Um, but destruction efficiency, what it's really talking about, you know, the mass of pollutants is not those two items. Right? It is the incomplete combustion, which is going to be all these other, the carbon monoxides, the unburned hydrocarbons, uh, the particulates. Those are going to be the, uh, what goes in the, the top part of this equation here to get your destruction efficiency. So how do we know what flares do? Um, in 1982, there was a test at John Zink back when it was on Peoria. Um, you know, in, in the middle of Tulsa, right, we were creating big fires, causing people concern and catching our roof on fire, all that fun stuff, right? Uh, but we, we were able to run this test um, through an organization uh, called CMA who where uh, there's an old school sample probe here that you, we put above the flame where we could take an extractive sample to figure out what the destruction efficiency was of these flames. 
And there were all kinds of tests performed uh, as we uh, uh, did these tests, and, and it produced a, an interesting chart. So really what it said, uh, what this chart said, um, we, we put different amounts of steam to that flare to clean it up. Um, and so here at, at some steam to hydrocarbon ratios, right, that where you had good combustion efficiencies, uh, but low uh, steam to hydrocarbon ratios, we had really good, uh, really good combustion efficiency. Some of these, where there's no steam, there was smoke. So actually a smoking flame gets you pretty good uh, combustion efficiency. However, the more steam we added, thinking, okay, hey, so you, you put more steam in, it's going to draw more air into the system, it's going to clean it up more, it actually dropped the combustion efficiencies. So, uh, so the, a big thing going on right now in regulations, especially in the U.S., but a lot of people around the world are picking up on, um, is that flares have been operated over steamed or over aerated uh, for a long period of time. Um, mostly because uh, the communities didn't want to see fire, right? So operators would turn up the steam or turn up the air so the fire would basically, uh, what they, they thought the fire would go invisible, right? But really there's no fire, right? The combustion efficiencies dropped way off and they're basically putting their flares out. So uh, the EPA is making a big push right now uh, to teach people proper operation of their flares so they can get back in this operating range up here and uh, have good combustion efficiency uh, with their flares. But it's, 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 it's kind of odd that uh, uh, all this was published in 1982, that oversteaming of the flares is a real issue. But that's all right. So um, again, so the CMA, you know, the steam, their findings was, again, that excess steam uh, can contribute to low combustion efficiency and a properly operated flare so the EPA decided 98 percent above 98 percent uh, was a good a good number for flare operation well uh, there was more testing done in 1985 in a laboratory right they were much smaller flames uh, because they couldn't be like industrial flares um, but this Again, they, they used a more sophisticated hood that, that took more sampling. Um, and so uh, some, again, the key findings from that testing, combustion efficiency uh, uh, gets decreased when it's oversteamed, right? But the other thing that they found, which is also very important in the design of flares uh, and keeping your emissions low, is that flame stability matters a lot to combustion efficiency. If a flame, if a flare is unstable, uh, then it starts to not fully combust the hydrocarbon. Uh, so it's important to make sure the design of the flares uh, have a stable flame and that flame's not going to lift off. All right? So a stable flame means that it's staying attached to the flare tip itself and not lifting off. Um, a lot of times if it'll, it'll lift off and it might put itself out or it does what we call helicoptering, which makes more noise, which is another thing you don't want, where it goes woof, 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 as it detaches and reattaches. So, um, so yeah, so again, 1985, we still knew oversteaming was an issue. But the EPA, uh, in, in their first issuance of uh, 40 CFR 60.18, um, they, they made some uh, requirements to the system where they basically just looked at the BTU level of the gas going to the flare um, and so a lot of people made to the BTU made sure that the BTU of the gas going to the flare was within the, the regulations um, but it allowed for improper operation um, so uh, you know there, there was all this pollution going on and, and people were um, starting to set up their own uh, their own test sites in their backyards and stuff and so they they started doing some more testing especially in the houston area right in the area of the houston ship channel um, and they started to see that there were a lot of emissions coming from the houston ship channel um, and they started pointing to the flare and they, they were saying there's a lot of flares in that area how do we make sure that that is being uh, good uh, and properly combusted instead of just venting so the EPA started uh, doing what they call 
um, these consent decrees, or they started with uh, 114 requests, which is they, they go to a, uh, an operator, uh, say Marathon or Exxon or you know some of these, these big companies, and they say, tell us about your system. What's going to the flare? And then they say, how can you t convince us that all that's burning? Well, they can't, because if you imagine these flares are, what, 200, 300 foot in the air, right? So if they're 200, 300 foot in the air, can they use those little sample probes on cranes uh, like we, we can out in our test center? No, because one, you got to get a crane, but then now you've got a huge fire. You know, the cranes next to the fire, they don't really like each other, right? Um, so, uh, so these companies had to start doing um, some different testings to meet the, the requirements of these consent decrees. Um, and so they would come to our test centers and we'd, uh, we'd do some testing for them to give them some data to go back to the EPA. Um, well, then uh, TCEQ, which is tech, the Texas's, um, it's their Department of, of Environmental Quality, they decided to run a test because uh, they were getting picked on there in the Houston Ship Channel, right? Um, so, um, so again, f uh, 40 60 R or, or 40 CFR 60.18, you know, all the regulations were being met by these companies, uh, but you know, this TCEQ testing was getting ready to show that they were oversteaming and just venting a lot of hydrocarbon. So, uh, in 2010, they came out. And, uh, you know, we've got some more sophisticated sampling hoods and whatnot that we use now. Um, but we, we did some, some testing on, on good operation of flares and oversteamed operation of flares. And, and what do you know? I mean, the testing looked a lot like it did in 1982. Um, they changed up the, the axes a little bit, but it's basically good combustion efficiency. And then you get to a drop-off point. Well... This, this chart that was made, if you notice, uh, they came up with a new, a new thought, a new concept. Um, it was kind of developed with the flare companies and with the end users and everybody that, that looked at how you really uh, measure the, the efficiency of the flare. It's not necessarily by the gas coming to it, but it's the mixture above the flare. So that's where this combustion zone net heating value came in. It's now what's the net heating value? of the combustion zone, the area above the flare. So with this new uh, principle, they kind of created this chart um, and the EPA was going to start to use this data uh, to uh, rewrite or recreate the rules. So interestingly enough, these are some of the some pictures from the results. So this is how important the operation of the flare and the amount of steam that goes to the flare is. If you notice on this first photo over here, that is what we would call uh, a flare at its incipient smoke point, which is just the right amount of steam for the amount of hydrocarbon to it to get good combustion efficiency. So the sampling measured this at 99.2% DRE. All right, that's pretty good. 99.2% is higher than the 98 standard, right? Pretty good. Um, this one, you know, had a little bit extra steam added to it. Um, so if we look at it, we had 20,000 pounds of flare gas going to it. Uh, and then uh, we added too much steam. Oh, let's see, steam to vent gas ratio. So if you remember that steam, this was at a 0.3 with a 99% destruction efficiency. This steam to uh, vent gas ratio went to 0.5. So just increased it a little bit, but it dropped all the way to 90. Right, but you see the the flame starting to go away. You see a little bit of fire out there. Well, this is the way most people were operating their flares, right? At one, a vent, uh, a steam to vent gas ratio of one, which is really not bad, so people used to think, right? Uh, but it, the the efficiency of it was twenty seven percent. That's a lot of hydrocarbon being released, right? So if you look at the hydrocarbon, the unburned hydrocarbons of that twenty thousand pounds. Uh, a flare gas in the correct operating philosophy that's 160 pounds well when you increase it just a little bit I mean you you almost go 10 you go a little more than 10 times the amount of 
unburned hydrocarbons being released to the atmosphere. And it gets even way worse uh, if you oversteam. So with this information now in hand, uh, you know, a lot of people said, yeah, yeah, we knew this in 1982, <laughs> right? So, so the question becomes, how, how do we apply this? Well, uh, so these, the consent decrees that were going out were making people prove how they operated and then promise that they were going to operate their flares properly. Well, uh, they created good practices um, for people to follow. Well, it's still not law or regulation, but um, if they didn't follow them, they can get fined. Uh, and a lot did. So the first one to go under consent decree, right, they, they admitted we, we're doing this wrong, right? They admitted we're not operating our flares right, uh, and they had to pay $3.1 million dollars uh, in a in a civil penalty, and then they had to agree that any any day, any time that they were caught outside of its limitations, they they would have to pay fifteen thousand dollars a day. Doesn't seem like a lot, but once you're out of compliance, it's kind of hard with your flare being two hundred foot in the air to get back in compliance without shutting your whole facility down. Usually, ends up costing you millions of dollars to shut your facility down. So the the costs start to add up. Well. Um, after, the, after the EPA started to do several of these consent decrees, uh, they decided to put it into rule. So several years ago, the EPA issued what they call the RSR rule, or the Refinery Sector Rule. Uh, the Refinery Sector Rule uh, was issued uh, to only refineries for them to comply to these new regulations that they were going to set out. Um, and they had to meet these new regulations. And if they had a flare that was outside of what was in these new regulations for proper uh, flare operation, uh, they had to do what they called an AMEL, uh, this Alternative Means of Emissions Limitation. They had to do additional testing at, at the vendor, such as uh, at our uh, test facility, to figure out what that flare could be permitted for. Um, otherwise, they came up, as I said, you know, they made this new measuring parameter uh, net heating zone of the, or net heating value of the combustion zone. Instead, it had to be greater than 270 BTU per scuff. So 270 now became the limitation. Everyone has to operate above 270 BTU per scuff in above the uh, flare. Uh, so what does that mean? So that means it's the the net heating value of your gas, uh, and then they they also add in the air that's coming in from the because you know, because steam flares it's not the steam uh, that's cleaning it up it's the amount of air that that steam is bringing in and that air is what cleans up the flame. Uh, so so they measure all this now and they they make this soup mixture I like to call it at the top, uh, and that that soup mixture is what they measure. Um, although they did help them out. A lot of refineries have hydrogen going to their system, and, and hydrogen doesn't have a very high heating value, but it burns really well, right? So they gave it a new number, right? So hydrogen now has a heating value for the rule of 1212. Um, it, it's not its actual heating value, but, but it acts more like a gas that has a heating value of, of 1212. So, so these are some important things uh, evolving in the regulations uh, because now, um, now emissions have always mattered, right? But nobody knew how to measure emissions coming from the flare. Well, some of the testing that's been done has revealed how you can uh, measure that based off this new soup mixture that's at the top. Um, and so, so there's now a, a better measure of what's going on. So the refineries had to be compliant uh, by this year, right? So January 30th of this year, all refineries in the U.S. Uh, had to be under this new sector uh, or under this new RSR rule. So it cost the refineries a lot of money to put in all the equipment that they needed to now meet uh, these requirements because uh, they have to monitor a lot of things they didn't used to monitor before. Uh, so flare design is now taken on uh, a whole new aspect of understanding everything, not just the flare gas, but how much steam, how much air, you know, what's your blower horsepower um, going to the flare so that uh, we can make sure that they're being operated properly. 
the other important thing to, to note is it's not just going to be for the refineries. So the EPA has already issued this rule to other sectors. So Ethylene Mac, uh, it got issued for comment uh, last month. So it's out there. The ethylene producers are, um, are under the gun now. They, they're going to have a couple years to come in compliance. Um, and then they'll go to the, the, the other chemical plants. So it, it's, it's an evolution when it comes to emissions, uh, this evolution of, of uh, a properly operated flare, uh, which ironically was known and understood all the way back in 1982 whenever they did that initial testing. Um, but now uh, there's enough data that have opened a lot of people's eyes uh, into the operation of flares. And so it, uh, how a flare is operated is, is a key component um, to the operation of a plant now. So that's a little bit about emissions, but where, how do we know where emissions go? So again, because most flares are 200, 300 foot in the air, uh, we have a little bit of test data from what they do if they're operated properly. Um, the government provides a document uh, referred to as AP42. And AP42 has a table um, that just recently got um, updated. Uh, they used to have factors that you would put into uh, the equa to an equation uh, from your fuel gas, how much fuel gas was coming to. This would tell you um, how much of each pollutant that you, were, you had going to your flare. Um, and that's because it assumes a 98% or greater than 98% uh, destruction efficiency. Uh, but there's a caveat in there that your flare has to be properly operated. Um, so now with the new regulations, people have to track and prove. Because um, one thing I didn't cover with these new regulations, uh, companies have to take snapshots every 15 minutes of their operation to prove that they're staying within this uh, within these bounds so so it's really done by factors uh, to give you emissions limitations uh, which is still kind of fuzzy um, and there's a lot of people working on new technologies to try to help that but uh, right now this is the best thing we've got So uh, another thing affecting flares um, and their emissions is the dispersion. So flares are high for several reasons, right? You guys discussed radiation uh, back on or several classes ago and then again uh, on Tuesday. Uh, so flares are a certain elevation many times because of radiation, but a lot of times it's also because of dispersion, right? So uh, this gas that comes out of the top Right, there, there is, it's not 100% combustion efficiency, right? So there is a little bit of uh, a hydrocarbon left over. The wind is going to tell it where to go, right? So dispersion is an important part of knowing uh, what the ground level concentrations of, of uh, all these byproducts are. Um, if you had, so, so why is this important, right? This is important not only uh, for the extra pollutants, right? That, that's really actually minimal. By the time um, some extra methane or whatever gets released from here, and it's you know one percent of all the gas going to it, and by the time it gets here, it's it's indistinguishable, right? Well, let's say you had something bad like like uh, H2S, right? So if H2S got released from the flare, you'd want to know how it's going to be reacting anybody uh, or affecting anybody downstream. So uh, dispersion is an important part of the design of a flare system because you need to know if it's light or heavy gases. That, that's a big thing. The heavier the gas, the quicker it comes down and the more it stays together. Um, there's lots of effects uh, with dispersion also. Um, so there's several ways to look at it. Uh, CFD can be used. That's a, it's a nice little modeling tool. Um, sometimes the better way to do it is, is actually wind tunnel testing. Because if you imagine buildings or hills even sometimes, they create low pressure zones on the backside that can pull that plume down. Uh, so, so wind test modeling is done. Um, and then 
Uh, you can also do some calculations, right? Some gas Gaussian dispersion calculations. Um, these these are all things uh, that need to be looked at, and typically there's experts uh, in the field that look strictly at dispersion. Um, uh, we, and we usually leave that up to the experts too, because it's a serious thing. You don't want you don't want to get that calculation wrong, right? To know if your flare needs to be taller or if it's okay where it's at. So that, that's a little that's that's most of the topics um, about flares and flare design related to uh, emissions. Uh, where we're going to go now is a little more into the technology, right? So actually, finally getting to see what what the different flares are and, and the different technologies that can be used. So when you're looking at designing a flare, there there's quite a few items that actually have to be looked at. We've talked about many of them. Right, but the flare gas composition and the temperatures of that gas matter, the maximum flow rate for each, uh, the pressure available, all these are key components um, to designing a flare. All right, so there, there's quite a list there, and, and these are the things that, that uh, uh, when, when designing flares or uh, when planning for a flare, uh, say if you were to be in a chemical plant, you would need to provide a vendor so that they can get you the right solution. Um, so once we have these items, we start looking at what technologies uh, are good for you. So the simplest type of flare, uh, most common design, is what we call utility flare. Uh, it's basically a pipe with a windshield and uh, ignition pilots uh, to ignite the gas. Um, we call this an unassisted flare, right? There's nothing there to help it burn other than uh, the pilots, which are, which are an ignition source. Um, so these unassisted uh, flares are, are they're the simplest type, but I'll be honest, they're becoming a rarity now in, in the United States because of so much regulation going on. Um, nobody wants an unassisted flare because it smokes and you get fined for smoking. So with, with all flares, and, and an unassisted flare probably has... Um, uh, a good example of a lot of these. There's two main uh, problems with flare tip life. So if you imagine this is a piece of a combustion equipment that's always got fire burning on it, what do you think is going to affect the life of a flare? Think too small a flame, too big a flame? Yeah, so really it's all about where the flame is at, right? So if the flame is is sitting on the metal all the time, it's, it's not going to have a very long life. So there's two items, flame pull down and internal burning. So we'll give you examples of those. So flame pull down. So if this is your uh, simple utility flare, right? It basically looks like a pipe and you've got some wind blowing on this. Um, we talked about it when I was discussing dispersion. What happens on this backside of a, a piece of pipe if you put wind across it? Yeah, yeah, you get a low pressure zone, right? So that low pressure zone that gets created by the uh, by the wind going around a piece of pipe, uh, it pulls the flame down. So if you've got fire coming down the side of your tip, your tip life's going to be pretty bad. It's not going to last very long. So uh, in that previous photo, you saw what we had around it at the top. We call it a windshield. Um, and that windshield doesn't deflect the wind. All that windshield is doing, right, is it's moving that low pressure zone away from the flare tip body. So if it moves that low pressure zone away from the flare tip body and that low pressure zone is still going to pull the fire down, well, uh, it's still going to pull it down on this windshield, which what we consider now a sacrificial piece, right, something that can be replaced uh, fairly easily uh, without it being the whole tip itself. So when you put the windshield on, it still pulls down, but it's on the windshield now uh, and not the flare body. And so here's some, here's some photos of, of different windshield designs that we've got. Um, just a simple perforated plate around the outside. Some are what we call um, ski type because uh, they look like little skis, right? They're just, again, pieces of, of they almost look like a fence, right? Uh, pieces of slotted metal um, or just a, a solid piece of metal. Um, anything to protect the actual tip itself. 
So when we talk about internal burning, uh, what we're looking at is these winds, right? So as the wind blows across the flame or across the flare, uh, again, you get a low pressure zone inside the tip. So it pulls that, that air in, that wind in, but then there's gas trying to push out. And so if it's at low flows, uh, that gas that's trying to push that air out can't get all the way. And so it burns on the inside and, uh, Burning on the outside, burning on the inside, they link to the same thing, which is destruction of the flare. Um, so, uh, but these were the earliest type of flares, right? So everybody put these up and they, they wondered, well, how can we extend the life of our flare? Uh, so the first thing they did uh, to fix the internal burning, at, so you got the windshield for the outside, but the internal burning is they put in a center steam nozzle, right? So they ran steam inside so that the steam pushed the air out, right? It didn't, the air wasn't capping anymore, um, and uh, the, the fire was able to be pushed out of the flame, uh, or out of the tip, uh, and keep the fire going out instead of burning on the inside. So if steam inside helped keep it out, they thought, well, uh, okay, what else can steam do? It has a lot of energy, right? Steam has a lot of kinetic energy in it. So, uh, these uh, utility flares would smoke. Um, so they, so then we decided if you, we put a ring of steam around these flare tips, it's going to draw in air because there's a lot of kinetic energy and if it, there's a jet, uh, it's going to draw in air behind it and so the air is going to help clean it up. So we put these steam jets around the outside to draw that air into the middle of the gas so that there's air in there. Um, and so the, these, this was the next generation of, of, of flares, right? We're, we're steam flares with uh, a ring of steam around the top side of the, of the flare tip. Now, this becomes an issue as the flare tips get bigger. So um, as plants start to have higher and higher capacities, they need more and more relief capacity. Uh, and once you get to about a three foot diameter, say 36 inches, uh, these steam jets can't penetrate all that gas. So, what's the next step? So the next generation, uh, we found ways to put a steam air mixture using tubes into the middle of the gas. And so by doing this, we're still able to get air, which is the key component of uh, this combusting flame, to the middle of that gas. And with all that air fuel mixture in there, you're gonna get good clean combustion and it'll prevent smoke and give you high combustion efficiency. So th this technology was uh, probably what's been around for the last 20 years as, as, the, as the best steam technology uh, available. But it still has its limitations because if you imagine these things get really big. Some of the, uh, some of the biggest steam flares um, so we've got one in Singapore that's um, it, it's probably 15 foot in diameter and it's about 25 foot tall. Right, it's a huge chunk of steel trying to try to ship that thing down the road and uh, and what you need to do. So one thing that we know is okay, so smaller flares are more efficient, right? But capacities are making us go to bigger flares which are less efficient. So how do we make a big flare into smaller flares? So in, in the last 10 years, we developed a new technology that allows us, oh, well, and here's a closer up picture of that, what we call a steam air or an SA uh, tube design, right? It's got these tubes in the middle and the steam spiders around the outside and the gas comes up through all these gaps here to mix in with that air. But what we decided is we could break up all that, all that gas. So instead of breaking up the steam, we broke up the gas uh, into uh, what we, the next generation of steam flares. We, we call it our Steamizer XP, but you've got your single steam nozzle with, with again, the steam air tube, which brings that steam air to the middle, but we've just got individual risers. So now we took this big inefficient flare and we made it a bunch of small efficient flares. Um, it, it, what it allows also is instead of uh, instead of air coming just through here, air can come from all the, all the perimeter. Um, so access to air is much greater in, in this kind of design. 
Plus, it looks like a spaceship, so it's pretty cool, right? <laughs> we get a lot of that as it ships down the road or as they get uh, installed on job sites. You say, hey, what's that spaceship up there? But uh, this is just a, a photo of one of those firing off. So you can see that the uh, uh, breaking it up into multiple arms really just makes it uh, smaller flames so that uh, it's easier to get to a smokeless uh, solution. So steam is not the only uh, motive for cleaning up flares. Uh, do you remember what I said the most important thing for cleaning up flares was? Air, right? So what's another way to get air to a flare? It's pretty simple. It's a blower, right? Uh, so you can stick a blower at the base of a stack and force a whole bunch of air up around uh, around the flare gas. So you got the flare gas riser that goes uh, inside the system and you have another plenum uh, where the air can come up and around um, all the gas. So as you see here, so you got, you got the air that'll come up, the gas that'll come up, and they mix there at the top uh, so you can get good uh, combustion. This is a, a picture of what it look, what one of these uh, air tips or gas tips looks like that would go inside an air plenum. So if you imagine there's a, another pipe around that uh, that allows the air to come up and mix with the gas that comes out of each one of these holes. Uh, so it's just a, another way. Um, if you don't have steam available, air flares are the way to go. Um, so a lot of people would ask, well, so why wouldn't you just go straight to air? Air, it doesn't bring in as much air as steam. It doesn't make any sense, right? Air doesn't bring in as much air as steam. Well, you're limited to uh, the horsepower of the blower. To get the same amount of air as steam jets would in training air uh, into the system, you would need some huge blowers, and that gets really expensive, right? So, um, Air, air flares are a good option, but they're not as efficient as steam flares. So that's a little history on, on why things aren't just using blowers. Blowers are, uh, they're a good use when you don't have steam, uh, but they're not as efficient as steam because it requires a lot of horsepower to push that same amount of air. So this is a, an air flare again back at our Peoria site. Um, you know, we've got 5,000 pounds an hour of propylene, pretty smoky stuff. Um, and that's what uh, most people used to do. They used to just flare it and it would smoke and it would be really ugly, right? Well, um, so again, I said air flares are, are a good option. They're just not as good as steam. So we can still even clean up this propylene with air. So you just turn on the blower and it changes the, the shape of the flame smoke goes away. Uh, this is actually the same test, um, just blower on, blower off. Um, this is the, the blower on photo. Again, that's the blower off. So you can see the, uh, the effectiveness of getting enough air to the middle of that gas stream. So if you don't have air, you don't have steam, but you do have pressure in your line, uh, you can go, again, unassisted, which is not that utility tip, but you, what we call pressure assisted, right? It doesn't use any additional assist media, uh, but it does use the internal uh, pressure of your system, right? and it turns it into kinetic energy, right? So again, much like the steam in the steam jets is creating kinetic energy and pulling in that air, uh, you can use the kinetic energy or the internal energy to create kinetic energy of the gas itself. So you're utilizing the gas pressure to mix in the air uh, efficiently. So we do this a lot uh, in several different types of flares. We do them in elevated flares and then also what we call multi-point ground flares. So in these multi-point ground flares, we have uh, individual burners. They're kind of hard to see, but usually uh, uh, enclosed in some manner. Or uh, this is up on the north slope of Alaska, so there's nobody up there. There's, uh, this is actually an interesting one uh, because the, the water all around there was actually uh, put there on purpose uh, to protect the tundra. 
right? So when the flare goes off, it doesn't melt the tundra underneath it. Um, so, uh, but these these systems, they use the internal pressure um, of the gas to flare off. But the other important thing to, to know about these types of systems, remember I said large systems are inefficient, but smaller ones are efficient. These type of systems allow us to do what we call staging. Staging allows us to provide only amount of burners that we need to combust the gas going to the flare. So if you look at a, normally a cylindrical flare, your day-to-day -day rates you can get in say like a four inch flare, right? But now you've got an upset in your plant. You've got enough gas that now you need a, a 16 inch flare, right? So staging allows you to basically expand that flare, uh, but really what it's doing is it's bringing on uh, more rows of burners. So I've got an example for you. Uh, it's it's kind of cool. We had a, an operator actually out in the field um, on, a, uh, on a site. You don't get to see it very often. Um, and this was several years ago, probably uh, back in the 90s or whatnot. But uh, he was working on a process heater and there happened to be a ground flare uh, that he knew there was an upset in the plant because he was on the heater. He knew it was coming. Um, so he just turned around and took some photos of this staging event. So normally this flare is flaring on what we call the first stage flare over here. Uh, but as there's an upset coming, that shuts off and it goes to all these, all these little pressure assisted burners. So this is as the flow starts to come, but as the flow increases through the line, right, we bring on more burners and more burners, and more burners until everything's one nice big fire, right? Um, and, but, but that's the full capacity of the, of the flare, um, but it allows it to burn efficiently because you're only commanding the amount of burners needed for that efficient uh, combustion. Now, pressure assisted flares are also used a lot in production facilities. So offshore sites, um, a lot of the reason is uh, because they, uh, pressure assisted flares create nice stiff flames. Uh, so the radiation behind that flame uh, is a lot lower than a, than a lazy flame that gets blown around by the wind. Um, and so if you're out here on this rig and your flares out here and it's pointed away from you, you want your flame to stay pointed away from you uh, to keep that radiation low. Um, plus, you can direct the noise away from the, from the rigs, um, and, uh, and there's not all the steam piping and air ducting that needs to go with it, so the weight becomes a lot less. So when you're designing a, a big boom out in the middle of the ocean, you don't have to over-design uh, for all that extra piping. Versus what they used to have, which is utility pipes. So again, people used to put these utility pipes out in the middle of the ocean, um, uh, but again, they had to put them so far away because this lazy flame, if you notice this lazy flame, uh, they had to design their, sh their ship or their platform to be far enough away that it didn't affect uh, all the workers that were on there. Plus, if it was coming back towards the, the ship, guess what else is coming towards the ship? <laughs> all that smoke, right? So these pressure-assisted flares um, help with in that design, you know, help to keep the, the workers safe. Uh, but also uh, provide a benefit of lower radiation and lower noise. So, uh, so here, here's some of the difference in design, right? So you've got, you've got this is your normal utility flare. Uh, this is a pressure assisted flare. Uh, so they look very different. Which one would you rather have? Probably, probably that one, right? Yeah. So we're going to look at a couple designs that we use uh, in elevated pressure assisted flares. Uh, so this is what we call a hydro tip. Um, it's simply a multi-armed uh, nozzle, right? So we, we have a, uh, a little gas nozzle up here that, that uh, allows the gas to come out at sonic velocities so that it entrains air and burns cleanly. Now the interesting thing about these is uh, the flame will detach. So the nozzle spits out the, the gas and entrains so much air that this whole section here is not really burnable. It's not until it gets up here, right, where the fire uh, is, is, lift, is burning. So it lifts off. So many times, so we put what we call a, uh, a stabilization burner that keeps that flame attached 
uh, in, in one location. So here you can see uh, what I mean by that. We have a stabilization burner that goes in the middle and really the rest of the fire is up here, but because all that, uh, they all uh, can join together, um, but they're, it's still attached to the flare. And that's basically what it looks like in real life. So these pressure cystic flares, they, they bring in a lot of air, right? Um, and uh, all that air mixes around and that's what, again, creates that good combustion. Uh, another type of pressure assisted flare is what we call the Kawanda. Um, how many of you guys know what the Kawanda effect is? All right. How many of you have uh, gone to the sink and went to wash off your spoon and it splashed water back at you? That's the Kawanda effect, right? So that's that water, even though it's coming down, when it hits that curved surface, that curved surface forces the water to go around the spoon. Uh, same way with a Kwanda, right? So we call, it's Kwanda effect and we call them tulips, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's not their real name, but they look like a tulip, if you will, at the top. Uh, so there's a gas jet uh, right here at the base of the tulip uh, that forces that gas around, uh, around that shape and directs it straight up instead of out. Now what that's doing is again, low pressure zones are a lot about flare operation. When that gas film is, is pulled around, it creates a low pressure zone on this side here that sucks in air, right? So it creates a film that sucks in air uh, and mixes right there on the tulip bowl and that, that's what helps again with nice clean flames. So the other thing that we can do with these Kwanda bowls uh, is uh, we can vary that slot of gas based on how much gas is coming to it. So based on the pressure behind it, that bowl will lift up and make the, gas bi the gap bigger uh, for higher pressures and smaller for lower pressures. So it stays smokeless uh, across its entire range. All right, and then we have one more kind of specialty flare for you. It's what we call a Poseidon. Um, it's another way to reduce radiation. So when you have these flames and you still need a shorter boom when you're uh, offshore, uh, this is normally what your, flare, your flame looks like. Well, we can add water actually injected at the flare tip so that it reduces the luminosity of that flame. So the radiation then becomes lower. Uh, and so, you want, remember, you, we want CO2 and H2O as your product of combustion, and so we're just adding some more H2O into it. Uh, but what that does is it, um, all this color, this radiation, right, it's actually hot carbon, right? So we're just cooling the carbon down with that water. So we're taking the, uh, the luminous flame and we're making it less luminous a little bit of water. These are specialty flares, um, and they don't, uh, there's several of them out there, uh, not always used, but it is a good technique. Um, adding water is a good technique to reduce that radiation. So, with that, those are the majority of the types of flares that are out there. You guys got any questions? All right, well, I think. I can return a good 20 minutes back to you.